people assess things because my background was in risk assessments, facility assessments. And so I write a lot of the standards still for the, I wrote for the Coast Guard, for Homeland Security, for the National Institute of Justice. And that was a school safety model for the uh, paid for by Homeland Security the Information Technology and Physical Security Councils, and we have uh, worked with the Anti-Terrorism Certification Board measuring counterterrorism threats, and even uh, looked at medication errors in pediatric patients under Homeland Security grant with Philadelphia Children's Hospital with a lot of other people. And it seems like that the number one thing that people worry about is having an active shooter. It's like the number one issue that keeps managing up at night. And I think that's partly because it's so hard to quantify. And it's also the thing that people have the least, uh, least control over. So they can control the temperature of the building, they control the parking lot, they can control all these things, but they can't really control somebody just walking. We had a guy in uh, down at Paris Medical Center, up in Paris Medical Center, and it's, it's right near uh, Cape Canaveral, Cape Kennedy. And uh, the guy rode his bike with his gun. He rode his bike to the hospital and parked it downstairs like he was going in to get a Coke or something. And then he went up to a room and held an old lady hostage and killed her and killed a bystander too. And uh, with no reason at all, and he didn't know the person. So that's, that's I think that's part of why it's such a, a frightening thing. These are all the things we have to worry about. So they put them into three categories. One is, weather related, one is uh, man-made, and one of them is sort of uh, environmental threats that aren't about climate change. They're about having a chemical spill in the, like they did in Baltimore when I worked up there in the, in the tunnel right under the city, a chlorine gas leak out of a tanker trailer that was, that was disabled underneath the city in about three blocks from where I was at the time. That was pretty exciting. So those kind of things, having uh, having leakage out of industrial sites is one part of that and uh, things like that. So I just, I don't know how many people here know what their threat profile is. This is a quick way to just take a look at it. And this is what the FBI does every year. They create this unit, the UCI, the Uniform Crime Index. And just to show you how random these active shooters are, percent of the rest of U.S. cities are safer than Parkland. So it's by far the safest. Who's the worst? Washington, D.C. has a five, five out of 100. And that means 95 percent of, of U.S. cities are safer than Washington, D.C. And then we, I picked some at random, Boston, Massachusetts. It's uh, in Beverly Hills, surprised me because it was a seven. It was almost the same as Washington, D.C., 93% of the United States cities are safer than Beverly Hills. Boise, Boise Idaho, again, it's a 30, 70% of the U.S. is safer than uh, Boise, Idaho. So it, it really doesn't depend on uh, whether it's in a suburb or whether it's in a city or what any region of the country can have an active shooter, as I'm sure you, you all have that message. So uh, domestic terrorism is one of the things I listed on that list. It's on the rise. And they just put out a new bulletin in June. Here's the copy of the bulletin. And what I usually do is recommend people send it out to their, their own uh, organization. And just go to this link. It's only a page and a half, but I think it would a lot of the people who come to these webinars are people in the target areas, and the targets are uh, infrastructure, hospitals, healthcare, uh, organizations that are have to do with with some kind of of cause, you know, like save the save the save our waterways, you know, drain the canals, those kind of things, and uh, it's all summed up in this little quick bulletin. Uh, this is the most recent one we had. This was last week, August 3rd, that I wrote about anyway, my risk alert, which I hope you all get, that they, a judge, a Texas judge ordered Spectrum Cable to pay more than $7 billion in damages to a family of an 83-year-old grandmother who was stabbed to death in her home by the cable guy. And actually, one of my friends in, in Washington, D.C. called me and said, did you make a mistake? Is it, is it $7 million, not $7 billion? 
I said, I don't know, let me go back and look real quick. And I, of course it was $7 billion. And what, so the guy, the installer went to the victim's house. He saw that she was very wealthy. She had her purse, her card sitting around on the table and things like that. He went back the next day wearing his uniform and uh, he, he walked, she let him in, of course. He said he wanted to check something about the installation. So 83 year old Betty Thomas got, it let him in the house. He stole her credits and debit cards, and then he killed her, stabbed her to death in her home. And that was in 2019, but the verdict was announced this week. So that's why I put on that little threat, short threat list I had there, I had lawsuits. Because who, who would, parent, uh, Charter Communications is a parent company of Spectrum, and it said the jury found they were grossly negligent, citing systemic failures throughout the company. Prosecutors said that Whole, and, it, and it's for something that you wouldn't expect. Prosecutors said that the, the installer lied about his work his history and he had a rap sheet and all this stuff, but it turns out Spectrum never verified his employment. They didn't do the background check on him and left other red flags and just said, hey, welcome to the company. And of course, everybody else thought he'd gone through the background check. And he, the Spectrum even charged the family after the grandmother died $58 for the service call. And when she didn't pay the bill because she was dead because he killed her, then they sent the unpaid bills to a collection agency. So it was a jury trial and the jury awarded the family 375 million in compensatory damages. But it said that Charter instead of Spectrum must pay 90% of the damages because their lack of policies and procedures. And in earlier in the week, another judge announced that they must pay an additional $7 billion in punitive damages. So they're trying to send a message here and I'm sure that they did. This is a, another unusual situation that I've never seen. This is one where the people, a, a lady, 30 year old woman went into an ER and stabbed a nurse and a paramedic they were left with very serious injuries. But what's interesting about it is nurses said that the hospital leaders had repeatedly ignored their pleas to increase security at the hospital, including requesting more security staff, adding concealed weapon metal detectors to prevent these workplace violence incidents. And so this a witness said that the nurse was stabbed in the back. She said, I heard somebody say she has a knife. So I looked up and I saw a woman, she was stabbing the nurse and everybody rushed over there you know, and the knife was just going everywhere. And they had actually formally requested for years, not for six months, for years. This is outside of St. Louis in Bridgeton, Missouri, that asked hospital administrators to add more security guards and metal detectors. And they said it was 100% preventable that, quote, when you're working at DePaul, you're literally walking down the halls looking over your shoulder. So again, that you know, this is going to end up in court, and they're going to find out that it was completely un, that it was completely preventable, which is what they're already saying. And the bond for this lady set at two million dollars, and she's a sixty-five year old. So then, a week after that happened, so all this time, the the hospital administration is saying we don't need any more security. You know, we have enough. We don't need metal detectors in every hospital. Well, one week after this happened, actually more like two weeks, they, they increased their security they, and their spokesman said that they'd been working on this for a long time. He said that the hospital had spent months conducting an extensive system-wide evaluation of our physical environments while also seeking input from team members who participate in our workplace violence committees. So, and again, they're going to make improvements to their entire hospital. They're going to add the metal detectors, the concealed weapon detectors that they want. They're going to add uh, more security staff. And they've already contracted somebody to have uh, coverage 24 hours a day. So that is just sort of the, the sequence of events. Uh, you've been on my webinars before. I'm not going to go through this completely. I'm just going to go through the top three or four here that uh, in 2020, we had uh, 40 mass casualty events we, in 19 states. In 2021, we had 61 in 30 states. And in 2022, we're gonna have much more than that. Then uh, law enforcement officers wounded 11 in 2025 and 2021. Uh, the, the number of shooters they had 42. 
in 35 were male and in 61 in 2021 of 60 which were male so uh you can just see that it's going up uh tremendously and it's probably going to go way up for this year also we talked about some of the factors that were revenue problems which is really not an excuse because you don't have to buy the controls all at one time they can phase them in over time people don't understand that and they don't understand i think a lot of hospital administrators about the fines and the lawsuits and the probable liability costs seven billion dollars before that the worst uh wrongful death lawsuit they had was the one at the mgm grand hotel mandalay bay in las vegas and that was an 800 million dollar settlement with the families of all the people who were shot that day so again Healthcare is still a target for everybody. And uh, how common is it? OSHA says it's more dangerous than working on a high rise building. And doctors are starting to finally come out, the, especially the emergency doctors. They're the ones who get stabbed the most. They had one in Houston where the guy actually, he, he found out the doctor that had operated on him and he hated, uh, rode his bike to work on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So this quote shooter actually he had a gun he actually went and bought a gun went to his target practice learned how to ride it how to use a gun then he went and bought a bicycle learned how to ride a bicycle then he went to the park on the weekends at night and learned how to shoot while riding a bicycle and then he picked a date and he followed the doctor and when the doctor came around the corner on his bike to go to the hospital that tuesday he, he fell in behind him with the gun pedaled up close to him and shot him in the face and killed him. So uh, again, the, the existential question, why is this still happening? And so security is still an afterthought most places. Security is still an expense item on a balance sheet without a clear uh, return on investment. You know, some things you buy and you think, oh, we're going to get so much more business out of this, you know, and that security is not like that. Security still follows a sort of a law enforcement model. And you sort of saw that play out in the Uvalde shootings. And also these two, the two things, technology, IT security and physical security, are, it's still separated artificially, I think, and mostly based on staffing and how you have an IT director security, and then you have the physical security director, facility security director. And again, a lot of the physical security or facility security products in the government, they call it physical security in, uh, in the private sector, more facility security that the, they don't realize how much technology and artificial intelligence is put into these cameras and things now. So it's still considered sort of a, a, a clunky kind of a of solution when it isn't at all. And you see almost every day that things are are getting better about that. We're going to talk about a little of that a little later. So I know that you have seen these before. I'm just going to point out the how, how this Chinese guy came and drove three hours to attack a church and only had 43 members. You know, and he came and he brought a, he brought a, he brought a glue gun and he glued the church door shut when the congregation was inside. And then he nailed them shut. He brought a nail gun full of nails. He nailed the, the, the church door shut. And then he also chained the church door shut. He changed them and he chained them and he put a dead lock, a dead bolt on them so that so everybody could see him. And then he went in and he shot. He didn't shoot like a thousand people or anything like that. You know, he shot. 10 people and all the people were 75 to 90 years old but a doctor had brought his mother to church that morning and he picked up a chair and hit the shooter with the chair it stopped him broke his concentration and the shooter killed the doctor but basically why did they do this because the church members were all from taiwan and he hated taiwanese people so this is uh talk a little about the uvalde shooting and of course the Tulsa shooting, which was two wound, two killed, two wounded, and the shooter dead in the hospital shooting in Tulsa. And this was part of a big uh, St. Francis hospital campus. And this guy had been operated, his name's on Michael Lewis, had been operated on by one of the two doctors, Dr. Preston or Dr. Phillips. 
and less than a month ago, and he was released from the hospital on May 24th. And that same afternoon, Michael Lewis went into a gun shop and got an AR-15 style rifle. And then the next day he went to a pawn shop and he got a handgun, a 40 caliber Smith & Wesson semi-automatic handgun. And he went back to the facility. And this is the Natalie Medical Building. So this isn't the main hospital. This is a medical building where the physicians and orthopedics and things like that are all in this medical building. These are all the officers who were there out in front of the building. And he went back, he went back in. He uh, he went back in, he walked right through the door because there was nothing stopping him. And he went up to the second floor and shot uh, Dr. Phillips. Then he shot the other orthopedic doctor who was up there. Then he shot the receptionist on his way up there. And then he shot a guy who was just walking by. Then four people, two of them died. Uh, this is the next one in Sino Hospital Medical Center. And these all, all happened between uh, the end of May and uh, July 4th. So this was Encino, which is downtown Los Angeles, or near down to sort of north side of Los Angeles. And this guy came running in to the hospital. He left his car, he didn't park his car, he just left it in the middle of the street. He had his dog on a leash. And he went in into the emergency department, ran to the emergency department, and said, I need some anti-anxiety medicine. And they said, well, we can't give you that unless you're examined by a doctor and blah, blah, blah. So he stabbed the lady who told him that. He stabbed another person. Then he locked himself in the emergency room for four hours. And they called the SWAT team to come and negotiate with him. He, had his, he took his dog with him into a hospital. He, uh, one of the ultrasound technicians happened to walk by and told the radio station that he saw the guy drenched in sweat, high on drugs, looked anxious and worried. And he also saw the nurse who'd been stabbed and he said it was, a, it was a very bad injury. There was a lot of blood and he thought that maybe she'd been stabbed in the abdomen. So, so again, we keep going through this, you know, what could have prevented this? And we could also look at the, so I'm saying also with that, let's look at the threat environment and see what makes sense to happen depending on the threat level where we are. Since you've seen the discrepancies here from, from 0.5 up to 77, it's a huge difference, and it means what's happening on the street outside where you walk in. So uh, obviously, I don't think panic alarms would have done anything for this situation in Tulsa, a live reception, or yeah, e either one of them, a live receptionist, no, because the guy just shot the receptionist, security officer president, no, no, there was no security officer assigned to that building, policies and procedures, no, faster police response, no, couldn't have helped. In, in this one, they had the policies and procedures, they just didn't follow them, which is par for the course. Faster police response, no, the police responded immediately. So, you know, what the only thing in this, either of those two examples of Tulsa and of uh, Encino were that they didn't have, they didn't have any kind of screening weapons detection when they entered the building. And so I've been looking at, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm looking at all the things that people are spending money on. And it's almost like you go to a cocktail party and somebody says, oh, we really need to have this. And somebody actually goes out and buys it. When it, you know, like buying bollards for the front entry to the hospital. I get that's very important and it's a nice to have thing. But the number of hospitals who, who get have a car drive through their lobby is a lot lower than the hospitals who have a shooting in there. So. I think we have to take these things, we, we sort of have to, that's why I'm thinking it's better to look, to start at least, to look at the threats and match them to the controls instead of just picking a control out of the air that you have enough money for in your budget and putting it in. So I'm decided that the way to stop this, and again, I wanna prevent this, that's my whole reason I do this, is uh, to be able to have the concealed weapons screening before they get up to the building. So they can't go up to the second floor and shoot somebody. Or like in New York, they can't go to the 17th floor, shoot five, kill five people that douse themselves with uh, gasoline that they brought with in a Tropicana, glass Tropicana container along with their assault rifle, walk right through the lobby like that because he was a doctor. So everybody's like, hi, doctor, you know, how's the gasoline, you know, and uh, go up and kill people. So. That's what we want to prevent is killing people. 
This is just another, you know, 71 year old, old oldest active shooter ever went to the Episcopal Church baby boomers potluck dinner. That was really the name of it. And sat and had dinner with these people at the church, outside the church in the little garden, and then took his gun out of his pocket and killed two people and injured one. He'd never been to the church before, had never met anybody. Turned out he was a gun dealer and it had to close his business because he didn't have enough business, I guess. And uh, nobody had ever met him before who was there. So we're talking a lot about uh, compliance and liability because this is how you get your programs funded because they don't realize what the, I don't think most administrators are sort of protected and I don't think that they really realize how bad things can get. And, and realize that a lot of this is about liability issues in most of the hospitals and the security companies who have these huge $64 million and up lawsuits end up closing because they just can't, they can't sustain it. And of course, if you're uh, in the CMS, uh, Centers for Medicaid, Medicare program, if you have something fatal happen in your organization, they're gonna close you anyway. They're gonna cut off your funding. They can even give you an exclusion clause where you can never, if you're a management or a board member, you can never qualify for CMS uh, funding again. And again, the CMS funding provides reimbursement to providers for doing medical procedures. So that's what that is. OSHA general duty clause, again, requires employers, every employer in the United States, whether you're the Supreme Court or whether you're a nurse daycare center, you have to maintain a safe environment three, free of recognized threats. And now we finally have an OSHA federal standard. It's already out. It, well, it's already been passed by the Senate now. It was passed a year ago by the House, now by the Senate. And it's called OSHA 3148. So I'll send you a copy of it with, with your information after the webinar. And it talks about all these guidelines for preventing workplace violence. And they took it out of the, the this was going to be the law back in 2013, and it didn't pass, so they turned it into a guideline. But even in the new bill, they say that their information came out of that uh, OSHA 3148. So this is just the information about that. There's a lot of pr products out there that tell you, alert you when there's a gunshot and tell you where it is. You know, if somebody takes a gun out of the back, zero eyes, take the gun out of the back of the car and you get an alert that somebody in the parking lot at, at a G GPS location has a gun. This is better than that because this actually identifies the people who have the concealed weapons, even your staff members. And that's how they get into the hospital. You know, if they can come in the back door, for example, use their access control card, they can come in with a gun. And we've had two cases of that in the last three months of nurses killing themselves in the hospital, in the emergency room, after walking right through the lobby with their gun. So again, we wanna keep current on these policies and procedures, especially these things related to lawsuits and things like that. Wanna have doors, uh, my big deal, securing the back door so people can't walk in. <clears throat> two or three of these uh, things we've had, including the Parkland shooting, which I live like one mile away, half a mile away from, have to do with leaving the back doors unlocked. In the Parkland case, it was, it was well, it was, of course it was hot, it's Florida, but uh, they, in that case, they, they, it was so hot that the guy, the SRO decided he didn't want to have to go out in the heat and unlock the back athletic field gate. So he didn't do that. He stayed inside. And he also decided it was too hot to check the back doors. So he left the back doors unlocked. And that's how the shooter, Nicholas, uh, 
got into their that's how he got into the school and then went on to kill and injure 34 people 17 injured 17 killed bled out on the third floor and by the way the the, the jury is in this trial right now this happened on i'll never forget i was here february 14th 2018 and uh they decided to, to condemn the building so all they did was take the bodies out basically and lock the door and it's never been opened since except this week uh actually friday he took the jury in his trial to see if he's going to get the death penalty they took him they took the jury over and they walked through the building so they got to see they hadn't cleaned it up either so they got to see all the blood spread out on the floor and everything and and all started with an unlocked door so that's and again i don't think people pay any attention to this i do lighting surveys all the time and i go to, around the back of hospitals big hospitals in I'll find five doors that are unlocked. Always one by the cafeteria, because I guess the cafeteria workers, they work late and they some come in early to do the food prep for the day. And they want, of course, they want a cigarette, even though they're in the hospital. And they, they go out and uh, smoke and they leave the door open so they get the breeze. Really bad idea. Also, again, comes back to the risk assessment. So how do you assess the threats? and also look at what controls you need and make sure that you're doing the right things. And again, talked about the healthcare emergency preparedness, the OSHA general duty clause, a new standard. So of course, in Uvalde, everything went wrong. I'm gonna send you a copy of this report because it's so interesting. It was published, it's an interim report, meaning they're gonna have the final report after this, July 17th. And it was from the Texas House of Representatives and here's a link to it. It's going to be in your in your video that I send you. And here's a guy holding it with his daughter's picture on him. And so these are the kind of controls that you think about having for active shooter. If and, and again, the controls you pick depend on what kind of threat environment you're in. So obviously, if you're in an area, I don't know if you ever like watching crime shows on TV, but if you ever watch, what is it, The Closer? or major crimes all happened in LA, you know, where they have a bad gang problem where I grew up. And uh, so if you have that, a lot of people are armed. It's not a place you would think of to be armed, but they are. And again, you, if you don't have this, the, the concealed weapons detection screening, people are just gonna walk right up that lobby, right up the door. They're gonna go up to another floor and they're gonna kill whoever they wanna kill. And that's it. There's no nothing about it, you know? Most people have the mass emergency notification systems again, because it's required. Most people do not routinely update their emergency plan. In fact, they're required to do it every year, but they don't check everybody every year. And I think probably only about 30% uh, that I've seen actually do it every year is required. Some of them think, well, every three years, what could change? Well, maybe, maybe active shooter doesn't change that much, but uh, flooding certainly does. You know, I've seen those floods in Kentucky recently. Saw them in, uh, one of my friends sent them from St. Police Officer in St. Louis. Sent me some. And I mean, there, there were people dying, uh, 35, 40, 50 people, and a lot of people missing still in Kentucky due to floods. And so if you have your emergency plan for this year and it shows up that there are a lot of floods, you have to put controls in place on what you're going to do when that happens. You don't just go randomly, you know, take a dart and throw it at one of these things and say, okay, well, that's what I'm going to do. It has to go in with the plan. It has to link up with the threats about how likely the threat is to happen. So again, Uvalde shooting sort of represents all the things that can go wrong. One is the it can't happen here attitude, which is the first thing I heard on the news when this happened, was they said, oh, we're such a close-knit community. Yeah, sure you are. That they didn't update their policies and procedures. They didn't do an investigation into Ramos, even after he did other horrible things. The neighbors were outside when heard the gunshot when he shot his grandmother and stole her truck. They saw him drive off, didn't call the police, didn't tell them anything that was happening. Again, the commander on the scene didn't get notified. They didn't have the right chain of command. The guy changed it from a ballistic event to, from an active shooter to a ballistic incident so that uh, they didn't have to do anything. They had, at one point they had, and, and what is so bad about this is at one point they had 386 officers, federal, state, county, sheriff's department, 
everything out there out on the other side of the door to the school where the kids were getting shot. The officers could hear the gunshots and they didn't go in. The guy didn't want his officers to get shot, so he didn't take them in. And that's why the casualties were so bad. So again, you know, you see it in healthcare every day, violence in healthcare every day, every shift, all units of the hospital, 95% of nurses say they don't feel safe from violence at work. I just saw an article yesterday that I'm going to write up where a, a, a hospital chain said they're now taking nurses that start at some really, I think it's $3,500 a week and they have, it's okay if you have no experience. If you're a nursing student in your second year and you have no experience, they'll hire you for an elevated amount of money because they have to have nurses and they don't have enough. 60% uh, of them want to quit. And again, one of the things that contributes to that, of course, is the, uh, the, the shootings, the hitting, the battery, everything, the assault, everything. The doctors are also becoming targets if, if they refuse to provide, to, uh, supply pain meds. And we had a story, I, I wrote it up, going to be published later this year about this guy who had a back, again, back surgery, pain, they wouldn't give him opioids and they did. And he overdosed on them and they had to call the ambulance. And so he had too many opioids. What he decided to do was uh, go to the Motel 6 and rent a room and build bombs. And so he built like six pipe bombs and, uh, and he got, bought some guns and then he put his suitcase on his lap and drove, he's 67 years old, took the city bus down to this Alina clinic in uh, Minnesota and walked in and started shooting. Killed the receptionist first, killed other people and uh, killed the nurses. And it was all because of the pain medicine. And he'd already gone to court. It, they had a restraining order against him. They didn't enforce everything basically that could go wrong with this guy did. You know, they still, that it can't happen here. We're, we're a place of refuge. I decided the best thing people can do is get something that's going to actually keep the guns out of the facility because I think that's the thing that works. It's not knowing that you have a gun in your parking lot where you can't get to it and the people can move in one second and be someplace else one minute later. But basically, this is a, a very affordable screening system that keeps concealed weapons out of your facility no matter what it is. And still, even after all these new requirements, 50% of hospitals do no, no screening. In fact, in the Northeast, I had never seen a hospital that had a, a big screening system like 14 years ago. When I came to Florida to the Cleveland Clinic to help them out, they had a very intensive screening system. And I remember that I was there on uh, Christmas Eve. They were still, you know, taking, they, taking badges and taking your driver's license and giving you a badge and things like that. But you got to have the screening. That's, it's the number one thing if you're, no matter what you're budget says no matter what they tell you, you insist on having the no screening first because it'll give you your highest return on investment, meaning it's going to protect the most people for the least amount of money and you usually make that back in the reduced uh, need for having security officers just sit there all day long. So we are all part of a risk-based assessment methodology that is fluid so that in adjustable and quantitative so that means that you pick you use it for high value critical assets and that of course in a high healthcare environment or any business actually it includes the people it includes the facility that you're in it includes whatever product you're selling or medication or pharmaceuticals or whatever you have and it's also required to these assist they didn't just come up with a risk assessment methodology on their own i was in like 14 study groups writing these requirements and writing them for IT too, along with NS on an NSA contract. Again, it's the number one thing you can do, maybe almost as important as a concealed weapon screening, just to make sure that you're taking care of the things that are have, have the most potential problem. And so what we want to do is we want to learn how to take that threat data and anal and put it together with the controls that we have in place and how effective they are and the cost of the assets we're protecting. That's a, a critical thing. When you say, yeah, it costs, you know, it costs a thousand dollars a month, but again, you're protecting a facility that, if it was damaged or destroyed, would be twelve million dollars in present day replacement value. Cost of all the personnel replacing all the personnel with their expertise and everything. Uh, add, adding in the maintenance cost of the control, the total value asset, and especially the likelihood of the threat occurring. So that's how we decide uh, which controls are necessary, which ones are critical, and like that. And that's how we come to the return on investment, which is basically bang for the buck. So this is, you know, how much, how much can we save if we do this? And it comes down to a it's again, it's a ratio, a dollar. So we could say every $1 that you, you 
spend putting in a concealed weapons detection system, you're going to save $100,000 or $50,000 for $1. That's return on investment, 50 to 1. For every dollar you save, you buy $50 worth of $50,000 worth of protection. And that's just how it works. And so you can apply this to any kind of, uh, conce any kind of weapon. That's why panic alarms come up uh, frequently in assessments is high value because you see the person when they're coming, you can report them before they get there, especially these, all these glass front buildings that everybody has now. And I hate and you can do those. And because the cost of the panic alarm is so low, even if you buy a whole lot of them, that it has a really, really high return on investment. So we also look at the, so we look at the assessment every year and that turns into the emergency plan and also the OSHA Work, work site assessment. So the CMS assessment can be substituted for the work site assessment. If you don't have CMS because you're not a hospital, then it's an OSHA work site assessment that it'll be used for. And what happens when you have something horrible happen, go to look at this, they're going to look and say, let me see your risk assessment. That's the first thing they do. And then if, and I was just talking to somebody who was a management at OSHA in Washington, DC. Yeah. You know that we go in and we ask to see their assessment. If they don't have their assessment, we already, we're already are going to find them. Not only are we going to find them and sanction them, and we're going to, you know, charge them, I don't know, a thousand dollars a day, ten thousand dollars a day until find nothing. But until they get one, we're going to put an agent of OSHA in their office. We're going to give them a desk, and so now management's going to have to come to OSHA to get everything done that they approve. If they have a, a new emergency plan, we're going to have to approve it. If they do risk assessment, we're going to approve it. They give us a list of threats and their occurrences, we're going to have to approve it. And they and you have to pay for that person's salary be in your office. And they'll stay there for six months or whatever to just teach you how to do this correctly. And then they'll leave. But it's a, it's a horrible uh, additional expense for anybody. These are the other, so the first thing we do is look at and see how bad the threats are as we've talked about how bad they are. Uh, look at how critical and important our assets are. And again, when you look at the value of an asset like a building that's been there for 100 years, you don't take the value of what they paid for it in 1918. You use a present day replacement value. Now it's probably a historical building, so value of it has just gone up astronomically. Then we survey the staff to measure their compliance and awareness. In uh, one place in uh, Michigan hospital up there, spent a million dollars putting a new training program in place and, and nobody seemed to pay any attention to it. Nobody took the training classes. They didn't know how to get everybody's attention. And they were basically doing the old thing because they didn't even know that they'd spent all this money on the training. So that's why you have to, that's how we, they found out was our assessment. We found out that nobody had actually attended the training. They didn't even check. They thought they set it up all online. But people were taking the classes. They weren't. And so that's why staff doesn't know really how things are going. So if you ask them, well, how do you have a workplace violence program? Uh, I know when I ask that question, I already know what the answer is, right? An investigator. So I know that they have a new program, but they'll say, no, we don't have one because they don't know. They don't know. They, or, or they say, yes, we do have one because they love the company. They love the hospital. They love working there. We also rate all these controls and then prepare our action reports. So uh, again, it's very expensive. If you lose a lawsuit on this $27 million from McDonald's, Donald's, 64 million for U.S. Security Associates, 82 million Stanford Health, hospital $8 million. And all this affects everything else too. So we don't just use one number. So we could just use one number, the incident report number that you report or the, uh, the OSHA 31, OSHA 300 series that covers all the internal injuries in injuries of all your staff members. It has to be reported quarterly to OSHA. So we use their data. We use Department of Homeland Security data, FEMA data. We use state, we use county government, regional data for weather events and things like that. The FBI Uniform Crime Index, the geographic data, regional data, all hazards data, and active shooter. And you saw in the beginning, and I've, I'm sending it to you, when we're done with this, the active shooter data for 20 to 2021. And then next year, we'll have the one for, for this year, 2000, all the mass casualty data. So what we do is we average these things together. So if their uniform crime index is at a 12 in their industry, they've had it had five times a year in their industry, which is hospitals, and they've had five assaults. So it all adds up to 22. And we divide that by our three data points. So if we have more data points, state and county data, total incidents per year, average incidents per year, we can, each one of these is a data point. So we can average them together 
In here, the assault would be seven times a year would be the average. After looking at all the concealed weapons detector systems, like the ones at the airport, which I found are 20 years out of date at least, I always wondered how they do that. It's, you see them sitting there. Guys travel a lot. You see them sitting there, you know, on their stool by the metal detector, and they're looking at the x-ray that they see there, trying to decide, is that a pin or is it a candle or is it a, a you know, is it a little pipe bomb, whatever it is? And then they have to, you know, move you someplace else, all this stuff. None of that you have to do anymore. This is uh, something that's been created by technologists and technology. This is their entryway security system. It maintains a three to 4,000 person per hour traffic flow because you don't have to stop. If you don't have a gun, you never get stopped. It can also lock down the whole lobby in one second. It can lock turnstiles if you have those. You can view it on your phone if you're having lunch. When they call you and tell you something's happening, you can look and see the alerts, see exactly what went off, see what the situation is. And again, it has a higher level of concealed weapons detection, automatically sees the difference between a weapon and a cell phone, keys and watches. So you don't have to take any of these things out. You just have to walk through with it. That's all you have to do. So this Athena security company that they're actually different than the other companies. Number one, they're the only weapons detection system that meets a federal standard from NIH, has the highest accuracy of mass casualty targets because we they've had this uh, looked at over and over again and, and checks it, check it every month highest throughput of people just walking through, the lowest uh, false alarms are in, and you can have it standalone or you can have it networked. You can have, if it's a, something like a nursing home or something, you can eat, turn on a silent mode if you want. It's not harmful to humans. It's not the dated airport technology and it uses in artificial intelligence to put these things together. For example, their medical de metal detectors only use ferrous or iron. Iron, that's all they detect. This uh, detects other metals also too. So aluminum, anything else that's doing. And again, it's affordable. This is the uh, Concealed Weapons Detection System. It's Federal Institute of Justice Standard. I'll send you a link to this too, so you can look at that. And this is a standard. NIJ 0601.02, Law Enforcement Correction Standard and Testing Programs. So this is how you look when you walk through. It's just two uh, bollards put side to side, 40 inches, 36 to 40 inches in between. You can set them however you want. You can go with your headphones, your cell phone in your pocket, your backpack, and you won't be stopped unless you have a gun or a large knife in there. We look at all the other controls too as part of our risk assessment. And so those are also, uh, we can see how much of the controls are implemented. So maybe like in that training program, they have the control, but they're not using it. So it counts as zero unless they're using it and have been trained on it. So then it's gonna come up with information we can give to the board. Controls by return on investment, how, how much it costs to put in place, how much it saves you. So this is to add one security staff member is it gives you a return on investment of 15,000 to one. So for every dollar you spend adding that, you save $15,000 by having a threat of online. It guarantees compliance and reduces liability and it prevents these incidents before they happen. You have to get out in front of them. Anything that happens after they're taken out is a, the horrible part. Talked about management, about what you need to secure your facility based on identified threats. And so you get, we can give you the threat data. In fact, if you want to call me, if you want to email me or even put on a chat message here, your zip code, I will give you your threat profile and tell you where you are on that one to a hundred um, federal uniform crime index. Again, explain to your management that lack of security is not considered an effective legal argument and start by looking at your access control system get a concealed weapons screening system, and then you can add everything else that you want. So again, use, using it this way in conjunction with the risk assessment, if you've already done it, that's great. Gives you the best bang for the buck or most protection for the least amount of money. If you want any more information, you can write me at Carolina Risk and Security LLC.com. And I thank you for sitting in on this today. Uh, this is my email address. And if you want to call me, I'd that's fine. You can email me and I'll call you back. 
or you can call me directly at 301-346-9055. And this is our, uh, no, this is Michael Green. He's the CEO of Athena Security. And he can set up an online demo for you if you'd like to see how that product works. If you want to see it work in real time, can come and do a demo for you right where you are. Can also set up a pilot for you so you can try it out for a couple of months before you buy it. And again, I think you'll be surprised at how affordable it is and how incredibly accurate it is. It's just finally understood how important it is. If you want to keep people changing in policies, it's not going to protect lives as much as keeping weapons out of your system, out of your facilities, out of everywhere, because this weapon weapons are the, they're just going to cause more problems, opportunities for worse things to happen. And it's so easy to screen them and get rid of them. Screen them, find them, hold them, take the weapon away, and they're gone out of your facility forever. So thank you very much. And I'll look forward, hopefully, to hearing from you. And thanks, Formation. So talk to you soon. Bye-bye.